still start with the kind of and we'll just be brief about it like um how did you get into it um you know sort of first memories of esotericism and and what have you a bit of that is in the books so we can um just do it quickly all right thank you and then um and then move on to the stuff around 1919 I, I can certainly blame rock music and psychedelia and and drugs for a lot of all this and the fact that I was a, a nerd for information. You know, when I was young, I was a history nerd. And I was a football nerd. Uh, you know, I knew all of the, I could tell you every single cup final and the result from 1872 to 1972. You know, I could tell you all the kings and queens of Britain from 1066 and what years they reigned. So I liked to give massive context to any information and when I came to like music, like psychedelic era Beatles, and particularly the Doors, it was like, where, what, what is the influences these people are drawing on? So if I knew that Jim Morrison had read a book, I went out of my way to find the same book and read it as well. So on that basis, I read Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, which is, was pretty good going. I discovered that there's a couple of, of Doors lyrics that are chapter headings in Golden Bow by Fraser so I find the 900 page abridgment of Fraser and I read the whole of that knowing because of what I feel about the whole ambience of the doors that they're not going to let me down if I explore those sources and that was what I think rock music could do then and what I don't really think you know it can do in the same way now that there were people that served that shamanic purpose and that helped open me up and so a part of, in the midst of all of that I'm a big Led Zeppelin fan I go to see Led Zeppelin at Earl's Call in 1975 when I'm only just 16 years old and there's this information that Jimmy Page is living in a house on the shores of Loch Ness owned by this notorious occultist Alistair Crowley and the name you know is somewhere in the back of my head he's been name checked by David Bowie on Quicksand on Hunky Dory I haven't really understood anything about it but it clicks and that year is the centenary of Crowley's birth and in October uh, BBC Radio 4 actually did a centenary programme and there was actually a photo of Crowley in the Radio Times <laughs> and I thought right you know I didn't very often listen to Radio 4 but I checked in with it and the multifaceted nature of the man completely and utterly compelled my attention that he could be you know a mountaineer and a yogi and a poet and a big game hunter and an occultist and so many apparently paradoxical things that mutability well that mercurial kind of shape-shifting thing that you can't pin it down but there's some vitality there in the background something that that, that was something that I also I, I was fascinated by the way that people like John Lennon and Jim Morrison changed their appearance over the years and even you know on the other side of, of, of the false Charles Manson these kind of characters out of that rock context set me up with a certain kind of sense of what was intriguing to me and, and where you could go to where you could get the mileage so at the same time as all this I become aware of, the, of, of Glastonbury the, the, the old BBC tea time programme Nationwide featured Mary Kane doing a little presentation on this theory of the Glastonbury Zodiac and that was the first time 
I think that was 1976, the first time I saw Glastonbury Tour, and it made some sort of impact on, on my psyche. And I, I came to be aware of the Stonehenge Free Festivals, and I really wanted to, to go. And then in 79, there was the first of the modern wave of the regular Glastonbury Festivals, as, as we would now kind of recognise them. There'd been a gap after the initial one. And I realised I could I could go at Stonehenge and I could go on to Glastonbury. And so I set myself up on this epic journey that I dropped some acid on the night of the 20th of June, saw here and now perform at Stonehenge, you know, went over to the Stones and saw the Druids at sunrise and without going to sleep at all, left and went on this epic long bus ride of total delirium and finally came into Somerset, you know, just at twilight and the sunset is bathing the hills in all this, this wonderful afterglow and there's the tour. And, you know, it was a six mile walk. There were no buses to the festival there. And I get there and I'm, I'm between the worlds, you know, it's been the long, it was the summer solstice, it was the longest day. And I get there just as Steve Village is coming on stage and, and going into his first of Jimi Hendrix's Are You Experienced? And that was a mythic event in my life. You know, after that, um, I ended up working in a factory all through the summer and stuff like that. But I realised that the, the personal mythology of this incredible journey to the West Country, and I'd, but I'd seen a little pamphlet by, by Mary Kane and I bought it about the Glastonbury Zodiac and it was like, I'd just done A-level history and it was like, what is this? You know, the way this is written is so annoying, it's so irritating. It's so non-linear. This is not academic in any sense of the word. But some, I, I was convinced on an intuitive level that something was trying to make itself known to me, that it was some, some sort of poetry or something that it was important for me to crack it. And while I'd been at the festival, I'd just seen on the horizon constantly the tour and I was convinced that it was a living thing. It wasn't just the fact that I was stoned or I was on acid or anything like that. My perceptions in those states were quite often pretty true. You know, they were not just hallucinatory distortions. The tour is a, is a, a thing, it has a, a personality. There is something going on here, this thing is pulsating. And over the years it drew me back and drew me back and drew me back and it, I realized eventually that I was always being, the festival was a vehicle. It was youth culture, it was music, it was drugs, it was what people in their early 20s respond to while they're at university and things like that. But I was always being taken beyond that into what lay behind the greater mythology of Glastonbury. And then I was very, very fortunate when I was 28 to meet Andrew Collins. And he, I knew, uh, had done some work in, in around the landscape on the so-called Glastonbury Zodiac. And I knew that from all conventional historical interpretations, a way of looking at the data, the Glastonbury Zodiac just simply isn't there. There is nothing that any historian or academic could ever accept. And yet, it seems to be a potent psychogeographical magical mystical entity in as much as a lot of people when they have been drawn to it felt compelled to investigate it and spent time out in the landscape read up on all the different materials surrounding it have had profound experiences and andy it wasn't in any book at the time when i came across this material to me it was off the map it was the most fascinating, extraordinary, compelling drama that I had ever, ever heard in my life. And in 1990, he, he decided that the psychic questing group that he got together at the time, which I was a part of, and we were on the quest for the, the seventh me and I sold and all this stuff, that he would try this experiment of taking us all around the Glastonbury Zodiac, using the same material that he had, had used and rather than doing it over a period of a couple of years, we would do this three day shamanic vision quest intensive and completely and utterly blitz our brains on it and see what the outcome was. And part of that involved one of the figures, supposedly, that there's a head 
that is supposed to be King Arthur and at the point where the forehead is there's there's a weir uh, that, face, that is part of the River Bro and in 1985 um, where in, in June when the weather was pretty bad as it often is here in June and the, the river was in full flood Andy had actually chucked himself naked into this weir <laughs> at midnight as a death rebirth scenario there's like a kind of a light and a dark spiral if you like in, in, on, on these sites and he said well yeah we're all, we'll all jump into the weir now for a lot of people it was like whoop oh great this is fun but for me I can't swim so it was like oh shit this is utter flipping terror and even though you know there were guys that were going to be standing around as lifeguards if you like and one of them said well look, I'll lend you this inflatable life jacket thing so that when you go down you'll come back home in a matter of seconds and we'll get you and it'll be all right. That didn't stop me from getting the fear. So I had this, he told us we were gonna do this on New Year's Day 1990 and I had six months to brood on it, six months to build up this sense of, oh my God. And I knew that it was a great opportunity, an absolutely incredible opportunity, because Andy had been led from his experience to investigate the Giza Plateau and went on to the work that that's, can now be found in his book, Beneath the Pyramids. There's no question that even something of, of the most profound significance had occurred to him there. So I saturated myself with everything there was on Glastonbury. Mary Kane, Catherine Mortwood, Bly Bourne, the anthology Ancient Avalon New Jerusalem. For a few weeks leading up to that point, I just lived and breathed it 24 7, watched Excalibur for the hundredth time, yeah, read The Unfortunate Avalon of the Heart, read John Michelle's books. And so when we get to it, I am primed. You know, I've got my background in my degree in study comparative religion, I know about Native American vision quests. I know about the idea of, of going out into a sacred landscape, putting yourself completely separate from your normal life, undergoing austerities, you know, maybe not, not sleeping, not eating in the way that you normally would, putting yourself through the fear and getting, with the aim of getting a vision, and you're supposed to you know, bring the vision back and heal the tribe, or at least heal yourself, transform your own life. And I was incredibly fortunate in having that mix of background to take into it. And the end result was, you know, we went pretty much 36 hours with virtually no sleep at all and very rapidly went into the dream time. You know, I chucked myself into this weir at about midnight and came out of it absolutely primal, screaming my brains out. You could probably have heard me 10 miles away and uh, someone's got a photo somewhere of me curled up in a fetal ball on the mud at the side of, of the bro. And as I'm walking back across the field, it's like I'm coming up on acid. It's like I look up at the, up at the sky and the stars, it's like the body of Newit breathing. They're just breathing in and breathing out and there's just all these purple flashes and stuff all over the place. I was in a profoundly altered state and we ended up coming into town after that. Uh, very, very bizarre. Some, some of the, the guys wanted to get a curry and a, a last thing at night in the, in the Indian takeaway. Me and another guy, John Horrigan, we, we just stayed out on the pavement and he got out a little primer stove thing and boiled up some water and we had a pot noodle sitting on the pavement, you know, like half past midnight. And then suddenly there's a screech of brakes and this enormous thud coming from down the high street and it's like a, a jeep has crashed into the, the facade of the Georgian Pilgrim and there's these guys and they've just leapt out of the jeep and they're running up the high street and suddenly out of nowhere there's just all these people and these guys come legging it up the road past us sitting down <laughs> having a pot noodle so a group of us thought let's go down and see what's happening and it was crazy it was absolutely crazy there was like every I don't know where they'd all been hiding you know every, every drunken young man in Somerset seemed to suddenly be milling about there was a big den in, in one of the pillars by the door of the GMP someone's obviously nicked this thing and there's one elderly policeman looking like Dixon Doc Green who looks as if he's about to be chucked through a shop window it's getting really rowdy and a couple of these, these Somerset yokel types actually come over to us and said do you want to fight and we said no that's alright 
uh, which just walks up, walks away up the road. And I can only say it's a lot different on South End Seafront, you know, the etiquette, you don't necessarily get politely asked, but we realised this was a very mutable, bizarre situation. Off we went, and into the landscape, and we stay awake till dawn, out in the middle of nowhere, and then we're going all, all over the show, and it all finishes at four o'clock in the morning, out in the centre of the Glastonbury Zodiac, where we recap all of the imagery, and we're sailing on the ship of Solomon into this enormous great crystal tetrahedron thing that leads you into the void at the centre of the universe and you come back out of it and I had an overwhelming emotional experience in which a lot of what I felt about Glastonbury all coalesced together you know I was crying later on after I had a couple of hours of sleep I am so glad I wrote it all down I wrote it down straight away I cannot emphasise you know the importance of coping diaries all this is in Avalonian Eon and I've pretty much said in there, look, this thing completely blew my brains to pieces and life is never the same again. And that's kind of borne out by the narrative of how things went um, six months, a year, two years later. But it's really uh, a golden memory of mine to contemplate just how completely and utterly warped out reality became the moment we got back. As if to say, you know, were we going to would we settle back into the lives that we had known before? And for me, absolutely emphatically not. When I say that my consciousness was mutated permanently, I, I totally mean that. That's not a vague statement. It really was. Nothing was ever the same again in terms of, of the way my psychism, my intuition functioned, the way synchronicity worked around us. It was accelerated. And we were a group of people that were living it 24 seven, that were prepared to just go off on the slightest excuse and get in a car and go out to some ancient site and sleep there all night or go to some peculiar place and invoke something or another and put ourselves into all kinds of totally bizarre situations. You know, even though most of us had full-time jobs I was, I was a civil servant, I was working in the VAT head office in South End, but still we were able to do this. A great you know, set of examples follows through with every single weekend um, in July 1990. So on the first weekend, this is a fortnight after we've, we've jumped in the weir. And as well as the questing dynamic, there was also a, a full moon Enclave amongst those people. Some of the questing crew, not not Andy Collins, but some of the, of the rest of us, and some other people, were used to go out every single full moon and just do our make make up your own Wiccan ceremony. We used to go out on Adley Downs. It was fantastic stuff, you know, going outdoors in the full moon. And on a Friday night, there's a couple of us sitting uh, at the flat of Alex Langstone, who, who's written a few things in his own right now, and. You know, we'd had a few drinks, a few spliffs or whatever, and it's quite late, 11 o'clock or so, and one of the guys, John Oregon, says, where are we going to sleep tonight then? So we make a list of sites which we believe are sunk just about within range, and we get a dice, and it's like, number the sites, one to six, throw a dice, roll right stones, right, pack our German army sleeping bags, because these were outdoor items that you could supposedly sleep outside in them, and literally, we're in a car at half past 11, we're in Essex, and we're off to Oxfordshire, and that's the roll rights. And it's just completely flipping ridiculous. It's miles away. You know, we don't even get there till half past three in the morning. It's practically dawn. But although it's practically dawn, it's foggy, it's been raining, you know, but we just settled down in that German army sleeping bags right in the middle of the stone circle. You know, there's like puddles, it's wet, you know, we can hardly see anything and we just pass into this sort of coma and then wake up and come back home again. You know, we have our breakfast with a little chef and we come all the way back to South End. And that is only the start of the day's activities because that night, one of one of our big things was our love for Dean Fortune and the Sea Priestess novel. And Janet and Stuart Farrer had put together some the fragments of ritual that are in Dion Fortune's novel and they'd created this ritual out of it. Fire of Azrael, all this malarkey. And we thought, oh, we'd love to do that. Wouldn't it be fantastic? 
And Alex had found this site right on the coast of Essex, uh, near a place called Paglesham, right out in the middle of nowhere, where a couple of different rivers are kind of going into the sea, and there's some flats and all that, and there's nowhere about. Uh, and we thought, yeah, let's do it. And, and that was the attitude of people, right, we're gonna do this thing. So we, it, it, between everybody, they actually get together all the wood in the, for the fire as well. And we really do, you know, go to town on it. We meet at our, our crossroads at midnight, you know, couldn't resist that, could not resist that. And, and we go to the, we don't even get there to, you know, half past 12, and it's it's the full, it's the full malarkey, it's everything. We've all got our robes and their swords, and the, the women have got their crescent moon dresses on, and we've got the incense, we've got the fire as rail, uh, you know, the water, the way the tides worked out, this was incredible, that the water was just starting to come in. And, and the idea is in the novel that the water, the water puts the fire out while you're doing it. And we did this thing and it was absolutely and utterly, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. We were completely apart from consensus reality. And simply as a thing in itself, without any intention or without any sense of, well, what result are you going to get from this? It's like, you know, you go and see some symphony or you go and see some work of art or something like that. It was just overwhelmingly beautiful on an aesthetic level, on a poetic level, on a deep, deep, deep level. You know, if you have a feeling for the full moon and the sense of witchcraft and the goddess and all that, the deal of fortune, it was bloody incredible. The water came in and put out the fire at exactly the right point, just as we're doing this thing to ISIS. So the clouds part, and there's the full moon. And it was just fantastic. So I got back to South End about half past two in the morning, and it was like, wow, what a day. I woke up at the freaking Roll Wright Stones, and now, you know, we've just done this. I'm burning the candle at both ends, and Mr. Sensible suddenly cuts in and says, Paul, you need to have a cup of hot chocolate complain before you go to bed. And that cup of hot chocolate complain probably prevented me from ending up in the intensive care unit because it meant that I actually went into my bed bedroom, or I would have gone into my bedroom that much later than if I hadn't bothered doing it. I'm in the bathroom cleaning my teeth and suddenly the whole house shakes, just bang! And it's like, what is that? You know, and I run out of the bathroom with like toothpaste foaming out of my mouth. And it sounds like it's come from my bedroom. What the hell was that? It's like the wardrobe falling over. And I, I can't even open my door. I'm pushing my bedroom door. I just about get my hand ready, get the light switch on, look in. Half the ceiling has collapsed. Like I've I've got all this stuff all over my bed. Like quite I, I don't know. You know it, I couldn't work out. Some of it was pretty sizable. You know your ceiling is not necessarily going to be that thick if you've got a loft and there's a roof above. But I filled up. In the end, I filled up a whole dustbin bag with it. You know, and it was just like if I had been on that bed when that stuff had come down, never mind that it was a freak that it would shit out of me. I, you know, I could have been lacerated. What the, you know, I've, we've just done the fire of Azrael, the angel of death, WTF, you know. I just, it, it was just too, too much of a, of a, of a mind blow. It's just right, all right, go sleep, put some, put some cushions on the floor and then go to sleep, figure it out in the morning. And there had been there had been like a hairline little crack across the ceiling. It had been there a while. It's not like this thing didn't have causality behind it. Something was was there, and it was the summer, it was July, buildings, you know, breathing and out. But for heaven's sake, you've just done the sea priestess ritual, you've just done the fire of Asro, you come back, you've got them ceilings falling in. What is that all about? And, and clearly, I was a long way away from consensus reality then. If you know, now, you know, I've got two children and all the rest of it, I would have a safety net margin that I'd be thinking, I shouldn't be doing this if, if this is going to be happening. But at that point, there was no off button. There was only further on. Now, in the long run, and this is another story altogether that I won't go into, in the long run, this proved to be the portal opening 
to what became uh, a psychic quest involving the River Isis along the River Thames that started manifesting for me in 1991, but there are a whole bunch of things that when I started putting it all back together that even at that point were already happening and this, and it was literally, you know, in the end we came to believe, ridiculous as it might sound, you know, the working belief was that I had a portal to the Saqqara Step Pyramid in my bedroom and I was literally burning freaking incense to it, you know every morning this is this is where I'd got to by 1991 but okay that's that's like week one you know of July this is a fortnight after so we got all sorts of things going on the World Cup was going on we were doing World Cup magic I think we invented football occultism in 1990 I'd worked out how you could put the the 1966 England World Cup winning team on the Kabbalah and then I'd mapped out the 1990 team on top of that and we'd done this it, it, it got you know the idea there was a guy he had a huge union jack that had come from colonial days in Africa and it was like the size of a football field practically they hung it up along a whole street along all these buildings we were going to go to West Ham's training ground and break in there and put this thing on the on the lay it out a union jack and then we were we were going to kick a football a little bit we were going to get a load of people on the Kabbalah you know, ten, per, 10 spheres and kick the ball back and forth. We never did it, but that was how we were thinking. And we watched all the football games together and we, we got ourselves in a right old state over it, you know, all, all chanting, ball it, when there's a free kick, ball in net, ball in net, ball in net. And, and you know, the psychics were saying that when we played the Cameroons, because the, the, they sacrificed a goat before each, each game, which was pretty wacky, that John Barnes was getting you know was was getting the voodoo vibes and he couldn't handle it and John will go off the pitch and he did you know so we were playing games of football occultism and I'm absolutely convinced that we set we opened up some sort of portal there because you know Glenn Oddley's later sacked for making comments about reincarnation as if that was ever going to happen in a world before we you know, the sense was we've invented this somehow we've, we've, we've there's been a knock on effect so the next Saturday um that Friday I was in work in Southend looking out the window and it was boiling hot and I thought I bet it's brilliant in Glastonbury so I, I rang up Alex Langstone at work I said oh god man I bet it's brilliant in Glastonbury he said, right let's go down there so this was how we would do it you know after work he'd just come around his motor we'd just go straight down the deck down here and we'd just sleep on the tour in our German army sleeping bags and then just come into town on the way down there you know you're on a long journey and you just start talking a load of old gibberish somehow we got onto the idea of like you have these things with like the uh, the Lombard RAC rally you know you have these little mini cars and they're, they're going these immense distances splattering all the mud up and all the rest of it and it used to be a world of sport on a Saturday afternoon why not do a Michael line rally why not do the entire Michael line in a couple of days just in some motors just do the whole thing all the way from Cornwall not, not in like six months or a year but just over the May bank holiday and we thought that's, oh, that's a great idea you know like the Knights Templars never did it at 90 miles an hour or with tentacles and dead and dance but we will you know this would be magic for the, for the new age you know and because of the kind of people that we were we, we, we just thought that's a goer that is a goer so we talked to the other people in the group and it was like yes and that was the seeds of the next year in May we did um, we did the entire Michael line from Cornwall all the way up to Norfolk and I've done that one a number of times now and as a result of, of you know it being broadly my idea and it's like well how are you going to handle this Graham Phillips had come up with some material which I've mentioned in Avalonian Eon about how the sites on the Michael line were aligned with the Kabbalistic energies. Uh, and he got it the other way around. There's a, the, to some people, there's a, a village in, in Suffolk called Eye, and people have said, oh, this is the giant Albion along the Michael line. It's his spinal column, and the eye is where the head is. When he had it the other way around, he had the crown down in Cornwall. And I just looked at his, his, his various um, attributions and thought well how, how can I use them and I thought of tarot attributions and he's also got a thing uh, which is a fantastically fruitful idea of landscape tarot that there are actually you know physical places which align with the energies of particular tarot cards and if you use those cards at those sites they, they are very good gateways into whatever the 
the magic of the situation is. So, for example, um, our KFAR site was the Merry Maidens in Cornwall, and TIFREF is Glastonbury. And so I was over in the Abbey downstairs in the Mary Chapel using the High Priestess card. Uh, and that's the card in the Golden Dawn Crowley attributions between Tifreff and Keyfarn. Seeing an open doorway in, a, in, in the wall behind, and I was inspired. Um, there was a Greek mythic tarot, which had got some interesting imagery, and there was the High Priestess, there was one where there was a door behind her that opened up onto a landscape. So, And you see the Merry Maidens in the background. You know, We had a fantastic time. Uh, and there were art, and that's, you know, Debbie Benstead retrieved an artifact at the end of it. All that just came out of this random conversation of me and Alex on the way down at Glastonbury. Being willing to, art, to act on it, but also the fact that these inspirations were just, just coming at us, you know, one, one, one day after another, and we were act on, acting on it. The weekend after that, A black questing extravaganza, you know, it wasn't all Grail Quest, Love and Light, you know, people know Andy, know that he wrote The Black Alchemist, he wrote The Second Coming. There's a whole thing about black questing that there are, if you like, we'll call them broadly the bad guys, and that there are things being done out there that are maybe not that nice, and that sometimes you get manoeuvred in the position to kind of perhaps mitigate that slightly. And you know, Deb used to come up with some incredible stuff and it was like something out of a horror novel. But because her track record was so good, because she could come up with direct information, historical, psychic material that you could verify, because it was true 90% of the time, because we'd seen her just, you know, pull artifacts out of the ground and I'd when I say I'd watched it closely, you know, on Glastonbury tour during the, the, the Zodiac Vision Quest, she'd seen, uh, she called it a follet, it's a, a, a version of one of the tribes of the little people, and it had led her to this rabbit hole on the top of the tour, and he's pointing inside. And I literally, I saw it happen because I was literally lying down on my side and you know her hand was there and her sleeve was rolled up and she was pu pulling away at the earth and I was like there and I saw the earth you know suddenly being pulled back to reveal something glint in there and yeah it was this little crucifix you know and this was a gift from the little people so I'd seen this kind of shit so many times we trusted her that even if it wasn't exactly that she was on the summit and she came up with some ghastly stuff about some hideous ceremony involving some woman um, sacrificing some dogs after having sex with them in, in, in the back garden of this temple place. Somebody had set their house up as a temple. And it was all connected with a, a bigger story relating to the Seven Swords and blah, blah, blah. And we decided we'll go down there, we'll come down to Glastonbury, and we'll see if we can stake this thing out. And whatever else we do, we're going to spend the night on Dundon Bacon. Now... As we're about to come down there, we hear the news from Glastonbury. At the time we'd done the Zodiac Quest, uh, a guy, a, a traveller, a French guy, had been murdered on the outskirts of Park Wood, which is at the centre of the Glastonbury Zodiac, by a self-professed black magician who was going around, as he put it, collecting souls. And it turned out that he'd got a list you know, of people that he intended to kill in sequence. And he was a known commodity in the town, I late discovered. He'd been, you know, he'd been bigging up that this is what he was and this is what he was going to do for some time. And unfortunately, he did actually set himself off and, and, and do it. But he had been arrested. But in the week leading up to us coming down to spend the night alone on Dundon Bacon looking for this weird walked out ceremony of sacrifice the guy actually breaks out of a police wagon and he's on the loose so suddenly we're spending the night out on our own in the middle of nowhere with essentially you know for all the cliches and it's a, a black magic murderer on the loose so that adds a certain frisson to the occasion and one of the guys John Oregon he'd been in the army so this gave him his excuse to get his camouflage gear out and crawl about in the bushes and all the rest of it. And he set us up 
basically as an armed camp up there. We had, he had trip wires. It was incredible what he did up there. He, he got some pretty big stones, virtually rocks, and could put them up in trees and put all these trip wires so that anybody that came upon us and tripped one of these wires would get a rock on their head. Uh, and we had all, all these weapons and all the rest of it. And it was a, it sounds pretty full on, but not that many people probably have spent a night out in the landscape in the middle of nowhere engaged in an occult episode with an escape murder on the loose. You know, it does funny things to your head. As it was getting to twilight and we're thinking, all right, we're pretty well set up here. here um, a hippie couple, you know, this guy and his girlfriend are out for an evening stroll and they trip one of the goddamn trip wires and this rock just falls right at his foot and he's, oh my God, no, we can't do this, can we? <laughs> so the whole thing is dismantled and we're just sitting there, you know, with like hammers and knives and stuff just going to sleep in our sleeping bags. And we never did come across this terrible rite of animal sacrifice or whatever the rest of it. But in the middle of the night, whether it was a poach or whatever it was, a shotgun went off right near us. You know, so everybody's bolt upright all of a sudden. Oh my God. You know, it's like something out of a horror movie. And it's just a cumulative effect. You know, it's like you're still, it's still July. It's still July. The, 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 next, the next week, we go out on a Saturday night onto Hadley Downs in Essex, which was where the, us full mooners were doing our wicker thing. But this time Andy uh, uh, came with us and Debbie Benstead. We got a few things on going. Um, you've probably heard all this stuff about, about Cunning Med and George Pickingill and the Witches of Canute and all this malarkey and it gets bigged up and supposedly Crowley was part of that. I don't actually believe that. But my loyalty is down in Hadley. We've got our own cunning man superstar. There's a guy called James Murrell, cunning Murrell, and he's an absolutely extraordinary fella from the, the, the 19th century. Little geezer, five foot, wore a stovepipe out, a long coat, used to walk around with a telescope. All the stuff, the witch jars, you know, the, the stuff that you associate with cunning men in the 19th century was all there. But he supposedly had... Uh, and this fits in with some work that Dave Rankin's done more recently, you know, sophisticated contacts up in London, had his grimoires, had his Kia Solomon type stuff, and was really onto the, astro onto the astronomy and the astrology, and he would go out on Adley Downs with his telescope, and um, Demi Benstead could see him, you know, he would turn up and he would talk to her, and, you know, I was sort of supervising these full moon rituals over, over on Adley Downs. And one day I was giving a lecture to the Earth, Andy Collins Earthquest group and she sees him standing behind me doing all this dibbly do like me head and stars going in my head and all the rest of it. We were totally into him. And he said to Deb, if you, if you come out and, you know, and, and sleep in a big pyramid, uh, on top of this hill, it, uh, the stars will come down, and you'll you'll find out what I was really doing. So yeah, it sounds mental, but John's gets all this tubing together, sticks it on the rack of his car. The whole lot of us all all take all these metal tube tubing on our backs a mile out into the middle of Adley Downs and go up on this hill and build this enormous great freaking pyramid thing. And and it, it's big enough. We're, it's big enough for it to at least partially sleep inside. So we all sleep in a circle with our heads uh, meeting. And this was part of an ongoing thing that we'd had for most of that year. That was what we called the Dream Demon Saga. That a whole lot of stuff was kicking off in people's dreams that was like worthy of Nightmare on Elm Street. And Deb said basically I can go into your dreams I can pull you out and we can all go off together somewhere and it was like well okay that sounds great you know prove it now it hadn't happened to me but it had happened to almost everybody else they all clearly you know she would say well I you know I did this I did that and I pulled you out of your dream and we went off somewhere and they remembered it as far as they were concerned it, it was really happening and she came up with this procedure that as often as possible we should all sleep in a circle with our heads pointed together 
and she had this incantation that she read out and when we were in the dream world it got more and more complex we all had it was like freaking thundercats we all had these superhero identities and powers and we would go off and fight this monstrous dream demon thing and that was supposedly you know you go into a dream and it's almost like a film set and people who were acting out all this stuff and they don't realise that just behind the cardboard cut out of the building is this monstrous demonic force and it was absolutely mental, you know, because people were waking up with like scratches all over their bodies and, and bruises where they'd been bashed around by these demonic entities. And, and this, this was a lot, this was something we knew it was going to go on for most of the year. And in fact, when we were on Dundon Beacon, holding our hammers and stuff as we were going to sleep, we had actually all slept in a circle doing this thing. We later found it in a Graham Master novel. Now, this was what was really strange, that the, the same broad format, even the same incantation, and the obvious thing is to say, well, Deb's seen this, she's read it. But, you know, she always protested that she didn't. Three years later, I had a really weird, detailed, not very nice dream that I wrote down. And three months later, I found that exact scene in a Graham Marston novel about dream, dream demons. Graham Marston was, was, was a, a somebody that his material impinged on our world from time to time. It was as if these novelists, they're intuitive, and they pick up on something, but because they're trapped by the tools of their trade, sex and gore or whatever, they mould it in a certain way, but they've, they've tuned into something. But anyway, we did all this, and... One another, you know, cunning Murrell had turned up at this EarthQuest do. One day, uh, while the Dream Demon saga was going on, I was giving a, another lecture, and Deb saw this guy who was like some Aztec sacrificial priest, dripping with like human flesh and blood and gore, standing right next to me and pointing at me, and he said, "You know, by the blood of my third father, I will kill you." And I said, whoa, that doesn't sound very nice, does it? And she said, oh, I don't know, it's some karmic thing, some weird family thing. And I thought, well, okay, it's her vision. I haven't seen it. All these people are getting this stuff in their dreams. I haven't experienced that myself. I'm just going along with it. Now, literally within two days of her telling me this, see, my father, he fought out in Burma, had a real bad time with the Japanese, played with nightmares, still waking up screaming 50 years later. You know, he would think there was Japanese soldiers in the kitchen, you know, and start kicking and screaming. He has one of these dreams, and it's a real bad one, and he, he literally just flings himself out of bed, and there's a chest of drawers right next to bed, he spanks the corner of his eye in, and he's on the floor and he's got this horrible, you know, if it had been a fraction different, it would have, he, you know, who knows what might have happened to his eye, but he's got this huge, great bruise and nothing like it had ever happened before. And I thought, hang on a minute, this is getting a bit real, isn't it? What is all this about? And so this is the background. So we're all up sleeping in the pyramid and doing this invocation. And this time, you know, this is another thing that was going on. And he was starting to get material through Debbie uh, on the occult aspects of the Jack the Ripper murders. Um, very similar to the Stephen Knight and Alan Moore from Hell stuff, but he didn't really know anything about that then. And there was a woman in London, um, slightly dubious psychic, but definitely very powerful. She seemed to be getting stuff about the Ripper murders, and uh, we, you know, we went back there and had a long word with her. And the dream demon trip that night was we were all going to go back to 1888 and check out the Jack the Ripper murders and to be quite honest I didn't really feel like that was a barrel of laughs you know I'd been out the previous week with the black magic axe murderer on the loose you know um, I wanted to kind of perhaps um, indulge myself a bit more fully in the Glastonbury Zodiac you know grail gnosis of light I, there were very very few things that I ever bottled out of but that night when we were all sitting in that thing, I just thought, I ain't going back to fucking 1988, the Jack the Ripper murders, man, I don't want to do that. And I kind of remembered as I was falling asleep that there was like a doorway and Deb was there and she took hold of me and, and she was starting to pull me through the doorway. And I resisted and it was like, no. Nah. 
and then the next morning she says well I tried to pull you through the doorway Paul but you just resisted and said you didn't want to go and I thought okay then alright you got me yeah. <laughs> and you know that was July 1990 August starts with Sudan invading Kuwait reality never reconfigured to what it was before I went on that Glastonbury Zodiac vision quest it never did you know why as, as the whole thing in the Gulf got more intense so yeah I've got a chapter I think in Avalon in here called Babylon Rising what led Andy into his work from the Ashes of Angels the investigation into the mysteries of the Book of Enoch the watches of Kurdistan all of that stuff all of that began brewing more or less from that point onwards in fact you know looking back with hindsight on some of the things Debbie was coming up with while we were on the Glastonbury Zodiac vision quest that was also starting then as well the more the situation started to intensify um, out in the Middle East and war became inevitable the more that flavour took over and it, it was like there were potential multiple timelines as to where our gnosis and our talents might have led but such was the nature of the world historical drama at that point that it inevitably got you know channeled in, in that direction I mean now you know this the latest stuff Andy's working on, I'm not going to, going to say what it is because he's keeping it to himself, but he's back to the back to the roots of that again uh, and, and taking it further into Central Asia and the sense that we could have gone there then even, we could have gone straight to it, but such was the nature of the, of the world historical drama. And it was absolutely impossible in those days to even have... Uh, a normal night of it you know you just go down the pub or you go for a, go around somebody's house for a party there was simply no such thing at that point and there is um, there is a little story in Avalon in Eon where called, in the section called Rock Me As Medeus which, which shows where that was going early in 1991 with the Gulf War imminent we'd gone round um, John Oregon's house and a whole bunch of things had been happening with him he'd read the follow up to the Green Stone called The Eye of Fire which is about how the original Graham Phillips Martin Keatman group after you know coming upon this, this magical jewel they get another one to add to the set and it's one that they don't feel ultimately they can keep and they kind of give back I think they threw it in a river or something like that and John was reading the book and getting more and more excited about it and a whole bunch of stuff kicked off around his house. You know, the night he'd finished it, there was weird sounds and, and flickering lights and and stuff like sounding like a bit of wood being broken in half. And in front of him, him and his wife, basically, this thing just dropped out of the out. You know, in their hallway, there's a sound like a bit of wood being broken in half. And suddenly, plop, there's this red stone on the carpet. And it's like, oh my god, this is our eye of fire and you know that's quite a start to the day really so that was just going on around there anyway and we have a little gathering around there and a few spliffs have been smoked a few glasses of vino and, and John's got this folio figure like you have a green man this is a red man and it was a totally similar design but it was on, on the wall and Debbie walked past it and it just came out of the wall as a full sized you know human humanoid form and started coming out with this blurb about this that and the other and she just sort of you know pukes up on the spot <laughs> and just settles back into a chair and starts telling us all about it and what she she says he's called Asmodeus you know now John's a, a Freemason and Asmodeus is, is involved with the whole Laura Solomon's temple and all the rest of it and the way it was left was there's just too much power building up in that house because of this apple and Andy suggested to John get that red stone put it in the mouth of this foliate figure tape it up just stick it in a box uh, and, and leave it for a little while or your house is going to catch fire or it's going to explode or something and so they did this and things start acting like they're coming in the morning and, and, and the furniture's moved around in the living room you know uh, where they've left this package and weird stuff is going on and then one morning they come in and 
it's like there's a bulge in this package and the type that has been round round it is still in place but it's kind of so what's this bulge so they undo it and there's like this it's sort of like an ornamental dagger letter opener and it's got like a figure of Joan of Arc on it and all the rest of it and it's like what and that was the day the Gulf War broke out which is also you know that was January the 17th that's Red Le Chateau Day as sure. well so there was this French thing with the you know the, the, bearing in mind that Asmodeus is uh, like a a desert storm demon if you like and this is Operation Desert Storm and, and Brenda Shadow and here's Joan of Arc and uh, it was just crazy I mean in the end all of the, the sheer cornucopia of manifestation ultimately that particular episode didn't even really lead that far although there were things years later that recapped some of the themes and the details and Andy did end up going to Rendell Shadow and some of this is in his 21st century grail book but the fact was because of the things that happened to us because of the kind of people that we were because there was some real talented psychics and manifestors amongst the group we had no sense of limitation as to what was or wasn't possible in any circumstance whatsoever. And on that basis, just being willing, all right, let's just go off and sleep in the roll like stones, you know, it's hundreds of miles away, we won't get here at three o'clock in the morning, so what? And, and we got this, you know, we got this from Graham and Andy in the early days in the 1970s, you know, the ridiculous things that they used to do. Like, probably the most stupid thing is that they were living in Wolverhampton and Graham starts picking up some visionary material that there is a, a crashed spaceship in Cornwall, you know, from tens of thousands of years ago. And if you went out somewhere and dug a hole, you would get to, you know, the, this, this spaceship. So they just leap in the car and just drive down to Cornwall. You know, it's already eight o'clock in the evening in Wolverhampton. And I just get straight in a car and go down to Cornwall and get there at you know three o'clock in the morning or whatever. And of course they don't find a bleeding spaceship. But being willing to act on that is part of the modus operandi of psychic questing. And eventually the results come in. You know, they end up going out up to on a hill fall berry ring at midnight on the night of the fall of the tempers and the green stone story starts there effectively. They've been willing you know, a place that they'd never even heard of earlier on in the day. They'll go there at midnight, you know, knowing it's the anniversary of the fall of the night's tempers and say, all right, come on, what you got, bring it on. And things, things start to happen. And, and that was just, there was no going back from that. But there's also no need to just endlessly repeat it either. It's like, what happens is, it's, it, we're, you're activated and it's switched on and if you need to become aware of it, your mind will function in that way automatically. You know, I, on the one hand, I don't go out and do things like that anymore. But on the other hand, um, when things are supposed to happen, I somehow am able to be available for it. And for example, you know, 2003, that was, that was a, I mean, how are we doing for time with all this? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. 2003. I mean, this I've written about this in in what is going to be the follow up to Avalonian Eon Aquarium Phoenix. In Avalonian Eon, um, I write about John Cooper Powis and his novel Glastonbury Romance. And in order to have done that in Avalonian Eon, it meant that I had to read the whole goddamn thing again, you know, <laughs> to do justice to it, I really did. Now it's a thousand pages long, and I thought it was a daunting prospect. And I waited for a sign. I'd already been writing Avalonian Eon for about three years, and I was working for Speaking Tree down at their wholesale warehouse. I was the manager down there, and I fold down plastic box came back from Courtyard Books and it had a postcard face down in it. This is right at the end of 2002. So I just turned it over and it's a photograph of John Cooper Powys. How often do you see a John Cooper Powys postcard? Answer, never. 
you know, I, I t in the end, I told this story to the Poets Society conference, and I asked people, "Have you ever seen this? Be anything like this before?" Nobody had. So I thought that's my sign. All right, put this by my, my computer. Start thinking about Glastonbury romance. We had a couple of copies in the warehouse, so I took one home. And I thought, right, I'm going to read it again. And this is just leading into Christmas, and Andy coming down for New Year's Eve like he often does he says look I've, I've got this fantastic job lot of occult artifacts that I've just bought and there's um, an ithyphallic Abraxas statue and there's this this thing called a demon caller which is like a big horn with, with one end of it as the face of a demon and the other end as the lips of a vulva and you can get this like fantastic Lord of the Rings horn sound out of it yeah I'll bring it all down you know have a little think what can we do about it so I was really big on Jung really big on the Seven Sermons of the Dead really big on Abraxas already you know I, there, there's stuff that I've written about it in Avalonian Ewan and in my Crowley book and I thought wow if we can get away with it let's go over the Abbey on New Year's Day put this statue of Abraxas on the altar oh, downstairs and I'll recite the word, some of the words from Seven Sermons of the Dead about Abraxas right we'll do that so on New Year's Eve we go up on the tour and like it's all foggy you can't see anything and people are having a go with this demon caller in the end the girl actually showed us how it's done nobody could get anything better than farty noises out of it but she gave it this enormous great sound that just carries miles into the void and then comes back as this spectral echo through the fog it just made your hair stand on end and we, we went down the side of the tour and, and did a thing to open up the underworld, let Gwyneth and the, the wild hunt out. We'd got this artifact that was a key that was found in totally bizarre circumstances by Andy in a churchyard, uh, whilst a mysterious dozen cowed figures walked into the church at midnight. I mean, that's all in 21st century growth. Mm, I, like I used that to sort of, I turned it round to open up the underworld. So all that's happening, and yeah, we go into the Abbey. Now the thing is, it sounds like horrendous blasphemy, but I never ever thought of it like that, because there was actually an, an abbot at Glastonbury who uh, was ultimately buried with an Abraxas ring on, a guy called Sephiroth Pelosian from the um, early 12th century. And just that sense of heresy. And also, there's so many people that come in the Abbey on New Year's Day. If you're doing a Roman, the powers that be will just manoeuvre someone into place and say, what is that? Because it's, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a statue of a bloke with a big stiffy and a chicken's head, for God's sake, you know. It, it, it's probably going to upset somebody in it, but we managed to do it. And, you know, I'm here in this warehouse and I'm thinking about Jung and Abraxas, I'm thinking about John Cook of Hoes and Glastonbury Romance and the whole duality and the good and evil thing and, and somewhere they're coming from the same space. Get a phone call from one of Gareth's suppliers, uh, oh I've got 800 copies of Glastonbury Romance, are you interested in that? So having had no more, uh, you know, you don't get offered 800 copies of Glastonbury Romance every day, you don't. We'd had about 20 copies in the warehouse. Before I know where I am, there's Glastonbury Romance by the hundreds all around me. We get another book in called The Wisdom of the Dream about you. And I don't know why I looked up Glastonbury in the index. I don't know why. I, I had no rational reason to think that it would even be in there but it was in there and at that point I discovered Jung had come to Glastonbury now I'd been into Jung for decades I've been into Jung since I was a teenager I read Man These Symbols in 1978 you know I read Eon and Psychology and Alchemy in the 90s I was really really into Jung and I'd lived in Glastonbury you know since 1995 I never knew that he came here it's within a fortnight of actually reading his words from Seven Sermons to the Dead with, with an Abraxas statue in Glastonbury Abbey, I discovered that he's come here. And as time has gone by, um, you might be interested, the, um, the Catholic Church, you know, uh, directly um, to the, the left of it, there's a, a place there um, with a, a cedar tree in the background. That's the place he stayed. It used to be a, a used to be uh, an inn. He stayed there in 1939, Easter 1939. He came down, he saw Easter Sunrise at Cadbury Castle, and he'd come 
with, with Emma Jung and a couple of um, English Jungians who had showed him around. Emma had chosen Glastonbury because she was particularly on the Grail Quest and all the rest of it. You probably know she wrote a book. You know, he kind of agreed to stay out of her territory, as it were. But it's, it's an absolute odds on certainty he would, they would have gone in the Abbey. It's an odds on certainty he would have stood within feet of where I was standing reading his words out, reading those Abraxas words out. And it was like the idea that there's literally the gnosis of Abraxas is part of the Avalonian ethers because John Cooper Powis has expressed it so profoundly when he has literally made the very landscape of Glastonbury itself a character in his book and the, 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 the full duality of light and dark, of, of madness and ecstasy is on tap here 24-7. So I was blown away by all this, and I read Glastonbury Romance, and I was so buzzed up by because Poets is a freaking genius anyway. If you have any love of literature whatsoever, Poets is one of the titans of English literature. It's just the fact that his novels are so huge and so you know difficult to tackle. And the novel starts at noon on March the fifth, and I finished my first reading in end of February. And this irresistible idea comes to me. Go on, Paul, you know you want to do it. Read it again, read it again and start on March the 5th at noon. Because, you know, my, my working arrangement was flexible at the warehouse. And I did. I started it again. And that very day, you know, later on, I was invited to a function over the, the road in the Glastonbury Experience Courtyard. It was the 25th anniversary of its foundation, so a bunch of people that had been involved in it, right from the word go, were all going to be there. I've done, you know, in the first four years I was here, I did 100 public presentations, so that's like one a fortnight for four years, and I did loads of it in there, so I got invited in there. And I thought, hmm... I got my postcard of John Cooper Powis and I put it in my pocket and I went in there very conscious that this is the day Glastonbury Romance starts and I thought this is Glastonbury Romance 2003 isn't it I am supposed to, this requires a particular consciousness to witness it in a particular way you are being primed to look at this with a novelistic kind of outlook that is also filled with this deep, strange, dark, light gnosis of John Cope Poets. You are to witness this. And I sat in the back row and I just watched everybody come in and I thought, this is weird. What is all this about? But because of my experience, I just trust it. I go along with it. But the thing is, the novel... The climax of the novel, one person gets murdered and there's a giant flood. And I thought, what are we going to get in 2003? Went all the way through it. Um, all kinds of stuff happens. You know, uh, The way that I filter poets into Avalonian Eon is all accomplished during that period of time. And I read his autobiography as well. And in the late summer right at the end of August into September it suddenly becomes apparent to anybody with a bit of sensitivity that something's not right around here and the way I kind of did it was something I don't normally do I just there used to be a DVD rental up the high street I just went and watched a whole sequence of gory horror movies you know every day for a week and it was like Paul what are you doing that for and then the truth became known. There was a guy very well known um, called James in his town. He used to be the manager of Courtyard Books. And he had a, a mate and they were a bit leery and they used to do all sorts of drugs and get, get pissed up and have a bit of a row. And it turned out that um, this guy James had been murdered by um, his mate in a ridiculous argument over some tobacco in his flat he stabbed him with a carving knife and this was in this was in Beer Lane you know, it's not all that far from where I live now and the horror of the situation was that his mate just couldn't face the reality of it so he just put the body on the bed and he would come into town and come and go you know, hang out in the pub with his mates or whatever and then he would go back and he would just sit with this gradually decomposing body 
And in the end, you know, the horror of it is that the people that lived downstairs ended up with maggots coming down through their light fitting into their room and the, the sore away son later referred to this as the maggot murder forever afterwards it was referred to as the maggot murder and James was very well known in this town he was a real party person I mean he was he was a bit of a cad and a bounder but a lot of people really liked him and the shock of it was flipping immense the sheer fucking ghastliness of it and I thought to myself well is that my Glastonbury romance moment you know I've watched this with Poesian eyes. I was probably the only person in this town that had that perspective then. I've shared it with people since, you know, but I watched that and I thought, it is very weird, but I think I need more than that. And such as my, such as, this is why Avalonia Neon took ten and a half years to write, because I then went into reading Glastonbury Romance for the third time in a 12 month period, you know, it's a thousand pages long and it was, that, that I ended up going down to Lyme Regis to see some concert and I went in a bookshop there and there was a, an autographed first edition of Poesis autobiography you know, and it was just before Christmas my partner wrote just I'll buy it for you so I'm now sitting there, you know, with an autograph, and, and it's like the thing's getting closer and closer, as if to say, it's an, it's an affirmation, you are right in doing this, you are following something that, that is right. And we get into um, the early part of the year, and it's Valentine's Day, and I go into Court Your Books, blow me down, there's a first British edition of Glastonbury Romance, with the whole cover intact with a photo of John Cook Poes on it, you know, marv this marvellous photo of him in profile. And again, Rachel says, I'll get it, that's, I'll get it for you. So that's my Valentine's Day present, a Glastonbury Romance first edition, for God's sake, you know, straight on top of this signed autobiography. And I thought, this is just astonishing. This is ravishingly rich. This is so fulfilling, you know. And so I get to finish the third reading with a first edition but I wanted to finish it I thought I must finish it for the 5th of March to complete the cycle that began on the 5th of March the year before I, I can't just read this book forever more I've got to stop it now and it got to the morning of the 5th of March so I still had a long way to go and I was in the warehouse in my lunch break and I was reading the chapter The Iron Bar which is about the murder and a girl unexpectedly who worked for the organisation, she came into the warehouse and she says, oh, I've just been in court in Wells. Uh, and I had no idea this was going on. You know, uh, the guy uh, who murdered James is actually sentenced on the 5th of March. And I said, OK, that'll do me then. That's all I need to know. That is the completion, you know, and I, I finished the book that night so that perception that level of awareness that's there with me all the time I just I don't have to really psych myself up for it because of everything else because of the cumulative effect and and now you see writing my books is is a magical act in itself because I'm covering so much ground you know it's like you can't separate that story from my insertion of the rubber, of the Cooper Poets material in the Avalon in Eel. I was writing all, all the stuff about Poets, which was, was referring back to my original reading of him in 1981. Well, all, the simple act of writing about it cannot be separated from that astonishing drama and, and how I kind of, you know, played along with it and was willing... You know, if I, if I was writing for some publisher and had a deadline, I said, right, we want this thing in six months, as if I would be able to read a thousand page novel three times in 12 months and allow that utter weirdness to play out. So all of that, you know, I thought, well, who knows when I'll finish writing the whole book, but all of that is in a query in Phoenix. I've written about that, I've written about Jung. It was richly satisfying to me to discover that Jung had come out. You know, that he had seen the sunrise on Easter Sunday from Cadbury Castle and that he had talked about, you know, experiences he'd had in the past with other cultures like the Zuni Indians and their relation to the rising sun. 
and when he'd got back to Switzerland he had apparently spent you know a bit of time in seclusion out at his lake taking on board the fact that he had been entirely immersed in a mythic landscape you know from from coming down here Silby and Avebury and then to hear itself but the sh the, the ridiculousness of, of only finding out that he'd come here when I've been so into it. In fact, I've, I've since looked through lots of big, thick biographies and stuff on the internet about him, uh, and it's not that easy to piece it all together. You know, it's not, you, you can read a big biography about it and it'll never tell you that he ever came here. So that, that, was, that was just fabulous, and the way the Abraxa stuff all combined with poets on that. And that's, you know, that is, I've got a whole thing called The Wisdom of the Dream. Colin Wilson has got a chapter called The Poet as a Cultist, you know, in the occult. The whole sense of people like Robert Graves, people like W.B. Yeats, the magic and the art and the creativity and the, the, are absolutely inseparable. And, and probably, you know, another one of the things I'm very grateful for is that I've got literary artistic sensibilities that I, I, I did have quite a big thing for literature as well as occult and history and all the rest of it and that has enabled me I think to connect up with poets there's a lot of people that have been here for decades and have never read it you know they've never ever read it and, and the thing that I say to them is it's all very well reading your Dion Fortunes and your Bly Bonds and all the rest of it but there is in Glastonbury a, a, a level of the game that is strictly you know you can appreciate it novelistically if you look at Dion Fortune's personal life, what it took to create those novels was a, a, a whole a, a, a totally unhappy marriage that ended up with them throwing the crockery at each other and shouting and screaming at each other like some episode of EastEnders. You know, Bly Bond, him and his, his wife, that was just completely horrific. You know, she turned into a virtual bunny boiler and just stalked him for years and just laid so much trouble on him. And in the end, you know, people think that it's his publication of the Gate Remembrance that got him booted out of the Abbey. The Gate Remembrance was on sale in the Abbey for years. It was only after the Central Somerset Gazette printed details of a court action that his ex-wife had taken out against him in 1922 that he got slung out. You know, that whole soap opera, that whole thing that can be, can be seen from a novelistic point of view of the why the strange forces of light and dark and destiny use human dramas to get people into particular states whereby they're then able to express certain things and do certain work. That's a fundamental part of the whole weird scene around here. Absolutely fundamental and I am so grateful that I've got that perception because I think a lot of people miss it or they're, they're just, you know, they're not sufficiently prepared to, to realise that it's going on. But I am aware of it, and, and sometimes it's almost like all I've got to do is just sit there and just write and just take my kids to school and go down the supermarket and just, it will happen. You know, the need to go out and actually settle down and, and robe up and wave some swords about or sit down and tune in and try and pick up psychic information. I, don't, I, I, I hardly ever, ever do that anymore. And as if you know I'm, it's quite clear that I don't really need to because all manner of fun and games comes my way so and, I, I think I'll, I'll wind it down with that so feed, yeah. <laughs> feed back to me now yeah, so sure. I'll go on forever with stuff like that there's well, probably no, more of it but yeah. uh, I mean this is a very good weekend to um, and a good point to to interject and, and move the topic elsewhere because it's the occult conference in Glastonbury for people listening uh, half the places that Paul just mentioned, well, we're in one of them. We're in the pub that um, the, the Jeep crashed into. Uh, we're across the road from um, the bookstore um, from the Maggot Murder. Uh, I love this town. But uh, it's, it's the Occult Conference happened yesterday, and it was fantastic, great vibe. But it does rather beg the question, given your uh, experience over the last several decades, of the difference between an order and a group because clearly there's value in group work. You've had yeah. you know, apported objects and, and this sort of psychogeography. And as you say, Andy Collins is probably the undisputed master of <laughs> psychogeography. 
um, uh, for England. And I guess if you wanted to talk about how um, how you get from, and I, I'm so glad that you said it, it came through like uh, LSD in music rather than mastering witchcraft because everyone else it appears to be mastering witchcraft. Uh, but how do you get from that uh, quite um, permanently transformative initiatory experience, which came up often uh, yesterday in the conference, um, and, and clearly that wasn't in a circle with people in robes, to uh, moving from Essex and, and settling permanently in Glastonbury and writing these books? The word initiation is a, is a big word. I think of it as an archetype, mm. and I think that there are things that activate the archetype. The structure of initiation that you get in magical orders is clearly designed to activate the archetype. But that's not the only thing that does it. You know, when you're ready for the activation, life does it. But you do have to have a certain amount of idea of the fact that the game is afoot what the game is and, and how to navigate it and the fact that I think there are in my case you know the most profound initiations if you like were ones that I was left to my own devices to navigate you know that was the nature of them that I had to figure it out for myself that they were so profound I mean this is a, another even deeper even stranger even darker story that one day I will really hope to do justice to in the most difficult writing challenge of my life but my final year in South End was like something out of a David Lynch film there are a whole bunch of you know very mysterious things at work here in in the work in progress Aquarian Phoenix I've got an awful lot of stuff about the trickster and the alchemical Mercurius to me the real action is always right out on the edge where it's very very difficult to pin things down and define them in a zone where a lot of people get uncomfortable and get very irritated because of precisely that I love the rascal gurus you know, I love Alistair Crowley, I love Gurdjieff, I love Raj Nish, I love Dalfrey John, I even love L. Ron Hubbard, I love Sai Baba, I love all the people that make people froth at the freaking mouth and just sort of spit fire and stamp their little feet about. Because I'm absolutely convinced with every single one of these people that there was something absolutely on fire at the heart of what they were doing and that if you're willing to risk a little bit and if you have discriminatory intelligence you know, uh, uh, and these guys have stalked me all the way and they've been my kind of teachers directly or indirectly and what I've made a point of doing uh, is I've read as many accounts as possible of individuals that have come into contact with what I call the false you know, some people call it you know, Shakti Kundalini whatever you want to call it there is a force that is activated by the archetype of initiation something is set in motion and you know it's incredibly disruptive and transformative and it seems to broadly work in a sort of set sequence but what I found most fascinating and where it really got going for me in the end because it's like I'm telling all these stories and, and yet that's not where it really all got going for me as far as I'm concerned it's when I came into contact with um, things like Reiki and things like the energy blessings and transmissions that are coming off of these controversial power gurus that's when it, it really really started to move for me I mean Reiki now is something that is almost a joke you know there's 50,000 Reiki practitioners in Glastonbury I should think you know the small lads of kindred spirit there's just hundreds of people doing this stuff I came to it all at the start of the 90s when there were very few people doing it and the person that first transmitted it to me had come across it in the ashram of Swami Muktananda in India and Muktananda was a heavy hitter he was the kind of guy that could whack out a whole room full of people and have them you know, barking like dogs and frothing at the mouth their heads turning around 360 degrees simply by sitting in the same room as them he was a transmitter of Kundalini false and what I found was um, I, I did I did a Reiki initiation in November 1992 
and I came to Glastonbury and took initiation into Rajneesh Sanyas from a guy that reckoned he was able to, you know, to transmit that with his hands as a blessing. And the combination of those two things together set me off on something that just lasted for years and was so powerful and so dark and so weird and so potentially dangerous that I can understand that plenty of people would have would have just floundered. But I read stories, you know, I read, you know, I, these days, for example, I've recently just come back from Germany, I've seen Mother Mira, that's what I do, that's what I, where I get my voyage from, I will go out and have Darshan with Mother Mira, and I read accounts of people who were with Rajneesh. Now, all right, Rajneesh had 90 Rolls Royces, there was a whole bunch of stuff that went on in America that was corrupt and deprived and insane, and there was a lot of stuff that was disastrous about it, but he had something going for him. Mm. He had some voltage, you know. This was what always fascinated me. I read an account of a, an American, uh, he was a, a senator, an older guy, in the 1930s, he'd seen Hitler at a Nuremberg rally and he'd registered the voltage that was coming off Hitler, that there was definitely something completely unusual about what was going on. Decades later, he'd sat in Congress quite near President Kennedy when he was in full flow giving a speech and he'd registered the fact that there was this tremendous voltage coming off of Kennedy. He'd seen Rajneesh before Rajneesh really even got going, when he was still in Bombay before he'd got to Pune, when he was a, a lot more small scale, he'd come into contact with Rajneesh and he'd said, this guy blows anything I've ever seen off the map. The sheer voltage that is coming off this bloke is absolutely unbelievable. And that's what you hear, simply being in the, in the same room as these people. You, things start happening in your body, you go off, you start having dreams of past lives, you go have, you know, Kundalini sicknesses and spasms and all, and it's like, what the hell is that? I want some of it, that was my attitude in the early 90s, I want some of that, and I flipping well got it. And it, it set me off on... One of my greatest past life sagas, actually, I mean, I had, I did Reiki 1, I did Reiki 2, and I finally did Reiki Master in Glastonbury in January 1995, and that was the sequence that set me up ready to come here. It was like dominoes just fell into place one after the other uh, as a result of all of these, and while these things were working through my system, um, you know, it got really serious, it got really flipping serious. I mean, I couldn't, it, I, the full story would take hours, but as one little example, um, in the summer of 1990, after Glastonbury Zodiac, one of the things that starts happening, and I do mention it in Avalon in New York, is Sai Baba starts cropping up everywhere. You know, the man supposedly responsible for more paranormal phenomena in history, but also considered to be, you know, notorious pedo and whatever, charlatan, you know, David Blaine could do any of this, blah, blah, blah. But I, I came to respect the fact that I seem to know an awful lot of people that the thing they had in common was anyone that got into him, weird stuff started happening to him. Sure. So I liked that, you know, because we were, I had a saying at the time, manifestation is my validation. You know, it's like if something physically will start happening, then I know that it's for real. What I make of it is another thing altogether. But me and my friends ended up um, being asked to sing at a side by my birthday, dude. This was another Glastonbury Zodiac. Um, you know, offshoot, uh, and we did. We sung a few Indian mantras, a bunch of like 500 Hindu guys, and all the you know their families and all the rest of it. And it was flipping incredible. And so my knowledge of the Sai Baba uh, community in Essex was kind of there in the background. Now there came a point when I was, I call it the cremation ground mandala. You know, there was some serious stuff going on around me, and there was a woman, a Chinese woman. Uh, who was worked in BAT head office on a different floor of me, but I, I knew her slightly, one of my friends knew about. And she had been telling all her mates that, oh, you know, I've got this fantastic new boyfriend. She hadn't had a boyfriend for ages, and this guy was a real sex machine six times a night and all the rest of it. She was well happy about it, but there was a little bit of a mystery because he was kind of going missing from time to time. And like, what's he getting up to then? Well, what he was getting up to was going to London and killing gay men because this was indeed Southend's gay serial killer. And she ended up on the front page of The Sun 
you know, I had sex with a serial killer, and with the money that she got from it, she went out to India to see Sai Baba, and like, when I heard she was going out there, my, uh, my mate said, oh look, do you want to give Sai Baba a letter, because she'll get it to you, so I wrote Sai Baba a letter, and it was put directly into his hand by a woman who had been on the front page of some for having sex with a serial killer, and what was in that letter was um, about me moving to Glastonbury, I felt like he'd been with me every step of the way, could I have his blessings for my move to Glastonbury, and a bunch of controversy in the Reiki world about there were some symbols that had supposedly, people were calling them Sai Baba symbols, and I didn't believe it, I had a dream where I saw him, and I said, are they from you? And he said, no. And I'd written about this in this letter, this was the letter that was put into his hand. Now, on the day that I moved to Glastonbury, it was a Saturday in June 1995, and a mate of mine was coming around with a, a, a van. Uh, he was a little bit late, and as a result of him being a little bit late, I caught the mail that I would otherwise have missed and would never have been forwarded to me because the person that lived downstairs from me you know, it just wouldn't have happened. And it was a, a newsletter from some American Reiki guy. And there's Sai Baba being asked directly about the Reiki Sai Baba symbols, and there is him saying, no, this is nothing to do with me. So, you know, I've asked him to clear that up and I've asked him for blessings on the path to Glastonbury. Literally, as I'm about to put my stuff in my van, in the van and go, there is that. Uh, coupled with the fact of how it even got to him in the first place, you know, that's only a little, that's a little taste of it. That sort of shit was like a year and a half of that. You know, there was people dying. There was people, you know, the front page of the, there was, oh, the things that were going on were absolutely and utterly outrageous. And the one thing that they all had in common was me. It wasn't a direct connection necessarily, but it was like I was in the center of a mandala. And it was like one of these Eastern cremation ground things with these vengeful spare and deities, you know, the wrathful and compassionate ones, chewing up your negative emotions and spitting out enlightenment. And this was going on around me and it was flipping serious business. It was well serious business. Um, Oh, and I'll tell you a few more if you're here. Yeah, if you're here, I was just going to jump in to say, my mother's been to uh, Satya Sai Baba's ashram twice. And right. So I'm familiar, well, he's obviously not incarnate anymore. But, yeah. Um, you're right about the paranormal stuff. He would show up in our house in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, that, and that, again, you, you these trickster... Um, uh, these tricks to gurus are definitely my jam. I like uh -huh. yeah. Anyway, more stories. I, yeah. I'm particularly interested uh, uh, just uh, speaking to other people who have uh, either successfully moved to Glastonbury or are still trying to. It is a place, from my perspective, that does appear that there are certain steps that have to happen to you before you can live here. It's very weird. I mean, in terms of the exact mechanics of it, I was offered what they call flexible early severance in the civil service, which essentially is a redundancy scheme. Uh, you know, the day I was accepted for it was the 500th anniversary of some past life adventure that I always believed, thought I was having rubbish like that, you know. So I left the civil service, then I was free flowing, and I, you know, I, I came down here and checked in with an estate agent, and a few weeks went by. And I came down the butcher to a guest house, and on a Saturday morning, I went up on Glastonbury Tour, went into the town, no one around, did the less banishing ritual of the pentagram, said, right, I need the result right now. Went down into the town, went into the estate agent, guy says, I've just got a case for somewhere. Um, I'll take you around there now if you want. I went round there. Wonderful place right in the centre of town, just over the other side of the car park from here actually. You can see Glastonbury Tour through the flipping living room window. I'd come down, Essex man, ward in my pocket, I said, how much money do you want now then? And I was in there in a week. I know other people that have just struggled, you know, with all kinds of stuff before they get here. And you know, there are great people that don't seem to get here and there are complete uh, Fuck pigs who seem to just be able to be ferried in here to provide whatever level of you know initiatory drama for us all. It, 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 you know the genius local idea. I, I fully subscribe to it, and it is something that you can't second guess. Powis in his novel talks about the invisible watches of the Glastonbury Aquarium. 
You know, they're like the movie to the chessboard, the puppet masters, and they're completely amoral. And you never ever get to understand the whole drama. You know, I still, after that whole thing with with why the Glastonbury Zodiac Vision Quest crew were manoeuvred into place in the weekend that that murderer was on the loose, is still mysterious to me. With each year that goes by, I can speculate a little bit differently and add a bit more salt in, a bit of depth to it. But I know I've never ever known. No, it, it, it uh, and it does require a head to be able to uh, layer the events that happen in your life um, with the wider things happening. Acknowledge that these are connected in a very synchronicitous way, very sort of Jungian almost, Jungian-ish yeah. way. Uh, and I don't know how much further beyond that um, you can get without going completely insane or just being uh, more wrong than you're comfortable with. Because yeah. any analysis is going to be largely wrong and you could go go nuts with it but whether or not I um, I like what you said about Genius Loci because anyone who's on the fence about the idea should come to Glastonbury uh -huh. because uh, you feel it as you drive in <laughs> I've known people I've known a few cases of people that have moved here in the summertime you know full of the whole apple orchard paradise bit because it's so flipping groovy when the sun's out and the blossom is out around here it's just bliss but then when the wheel of the year turns and it gets to Samhain and it gets a bit weird and a bit dark, they just they just packed up and gone. And I just couldn't handle it. I wasn't expecting this. The wheel of the year is, is incredible round here. Absolutely incredible. The, the, the difference in mood that you get from just it suddenly coming over all cloudy to the sun coming out, which is pretty straightforward stuff. It's nothing too dramatic, but the difference it makes to just everything is 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 quite quite astonishing. That's a great observation. I was staying here um, for the Day of the Dead festival in October. Yeah, and uh, you're right, Glastonbury. Glastonbury at Halloween <laughs> is not Glastonbury at the Equinox. No, nah. no, nah. yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we were talking about this at Megalithomania last year. Um, you're doing some. Uh, research for another book. Uh, oh my God! Yes, the unfortunate, yeah, unfortunate in the age of mind. Yeah, I, that's it, another little thing that's that really. I just don't know how long this bit of string is going to be because the more I get into it, the deeper I get. I'm I'm writing about you know the beginning of it, if you like. The the point of entry is the imagery used by the unfortunate in 1940 for meditational visualization purposes in what's become known as the Magical Battle of Britain imagery focused on Glastonbury tour, inside the tour, big red rose and across the gold, you know, cabalistic stuff, uh, King Arthur, Merlin, Virgin Mary, Jesus, and how that becomes a lens into the past and also into the future from that point. I'd connected up with this stuff in the 90s, done my own versions of it, realised it was still alive and kicking and some profound, profound stuff happened as a result of it. But I also realised that the stuff hadn't arisen out of a vacuum. That the fact that she and her, her companions could even come up with this imagery, what lay behind it? You, you'd got at least half a century, virtually, of the build-up of the rebirth of Glastonbury that leads you to the point where certain ideas have, have particular, you know, reverberation. And the book by Patrick Benham, The Avalonians, um, was my fuel for that the broad stories of, of Frederick Blyborne and As Button and particularly Wellesley Tudor Pole and the Blue Glass Bowl saga. All of these characters are fundamental to the rebirth of Glastonbury and setting it up in such a way that it's got a particular something about it when it comes to nineteen forty. And so I thought I'd trace the roots of that and trace the roots of what was going on in Germany at the same time. You know, the whole Nazi occult thing is something that I've been fascinated with for, for decades now. And, you know, it's almost embarrassing to look back at some of the books I was reading on it in the early days. But, you know, there is some solid stuff there now, thanks to people like Nicholas Goodrick Clark. So I joined all that together and I started this thing in, in 2010, which was a big... Um, Battle of Britain anniversary, Dunkirk anniversary, and then I stopped to go back on Aquarium Phoenix. Now we're on this centenary of the First World War. Um, I found myself reawakening my inner history nerd because when I was when I was twelve, I used to I, I had JFC Fuller's 
decisive battles of the Western world and their influence on history. There was an abridged two paperback version. I used to just sit in bed on Sunday morning and just read this stuff. And it obviously freaked me out when I later discovered Fuller was a big follower of Crowley and all the rest of it. But it, this year, you know, you can get these Amazon paperbacks, one pound, one penny for a manky paperback, and you just pay the postage. Well, I got I got my decisive battles, the later one, the modern ones back again. I started having a look at it, and I thought, wow, I was reading this when I was twelve. Good God, you know, it's pretty full on stuff. And I've reconnected with all of that, and. I'm quite possibly going to give a little lecture or a blog talk, radio talk on um, the weirdness of 1914 because the cast of characters that assembled for this drama was absolutely ridiculous in terms of how peculiar they were and how if they'd been a little bit more sensible you know the thing that I've started to appreciate is that not the exact sequence of events in 1914 was the most complicated cock up in the entire history of the world you know no one no one has got a handle on it completely because you need to have all this source material you know in the original languages of about a dozen different countries every single person that was even remotely involved in this stuff ended up writing these boring tedious memoirs in which they claimed there was nothing to do with them you know in the interwar years and with each decade that goes by, the perspective on what it was all about is continually shifting. I mean, the thing that struck me, because I'm, I'm kind of doing it, the way I'm writing it is I'm putting in some esoteric history, Wellesley Tudor Pole did this, Blybond did that, and then, you know, literally that same week, something or another was happening that was one of the signposts to the route to 1914. And Blybond's psychic material, people think of it, we're talking about the Abbey, He's talking about catastrophic war and red poppies in the fields in 1911. You know, as far as that, that'll do for me. And in 1900, in February 1900, the French cabinet was seriously discussing how they conduct a war against Britain. You know, a, a world war that they'd invade India from French Indochina, that they'd send another expedition to Egypt like Napoleon did, and. and because there was a whole thing going on between France and, and Britain in Africa about, you know, France wanted Britain to acknowledge Morocco and Britain wanted France to acknowledge Egypt and blah, blah, blah. They were having a right old row then. Now, they eventually, thanks to Edward, the, Edward the Seventh, actually, he had quite a lot to do with forging the Entente. They um, signed this famous Entente Cordial. Uh, and that, although it's not a formal military agreement, it's the beginning of a sequence that brings them ever more closely together and it's considered to be. So when did they sign that? April the 8th, 1904. Can you think of anything else that was happening on April the 8th, 1904? Wow. When it comes to, you know, yeah. the significance of dif different epochs opening up. This is where I like your stuff. You see horizontally. I love it. That's Cause, amazing. You know, there's <laughs> Alistair Crowley and Rose out in Cairo sitting at a desk getting yeah. the first chapter of the Book of the Law at the, on the same day that the Entente Cordiale has been signed. And the, obviously, the whole remit of what's come through to them over the previous weeks leading into that is the old world's going up in flames. Now, at that point, no one's going to think that that's what the Entente Cordiale is going to lead to. They're going to think the exact opposite. But in fact, you know, there is just a whole sequence of events. Um, the war between Russia and Japan that was just absolutely epic absolutely epic and Russia gets trashed and when Russia and Britain come to agreements you know they're, they're, Britain always thought Russia was a big problem they come to an arrangement in 1907 France and Russia have already come to an agreement but the whole thing about out in India and the great game and all that malarkey that's pretty much chilled between Russia and Britain so what that actually means is that the only place that Russia's got any manoeuvre left is in the Balkans. You know, they, they're trying to spread this thing right across Asia. They've got stuff going on with Japan. They've got stuff going on with Britain. But circumstances just mould it in such a way that the only room that they've got to make a bit of noise and, and say, look how important and strong we are, is in the Balkans. And at the time, you know, the Serbian nationalists, got that barking mad those guys they're maniacs the way they're playing out at that time the things that were going on out there are just ridiculous 
Uh, and then, of course, you get to the final denouement, you know, June 1914, Sarajevo. That was a preposterous scenario. They send the royal couple in on the anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo, which is the biggest day for Serbian nationalism, you know, that there is. You're more or less guaranteeing that somebody is going to get the ump about and be in there. And then the way the whole thing pans out, a bomb is thrown at the motorcade, hits the second car, you know, guys are wounded, they get taken to hospital. Imagine now if Wills and Kate are on a foreign visit and somebody bombs the car behind them. They're going to be yanked out of there by elite special forces in five seconds flat. They're not still going to be driving around half an hour later, are they? But, you know, the Duke says, right, let's, let's go to the hospital. Yeah, they have a brief public event in some town hall and they want to go and see the wounded guys in the hospital. Fair enough. I go out of there and then the driver takes a wrong turn. He doesn't know how to get back there and he just happens to drop. Gavrilo Princep has given up for the day. You know, there's a team of half a dozen of them that are all going for it. And he's just standing around having a sauna on the street and then suddenly, what? They're coming down here. That's <laughs> my chance. Uh, and, and history is made. And, and people, you know, they make a lot about the fact that this Serbian group, uh, they were members of this organisation called the Black Hand and, and they used pseudo-Masonic initiations and so on. And, and, you know, Illuminati paranoids can just gallop off with this. But the fact is, it was, it was, it was the indeterminate chaos factor that led to that exact convergence. Or, or you know, this, the mercurial spirit of history, which is a monstrous and bizarre thing. And you got this whole thing with Rasputin, you know. If, I don't know if, you, if you've ever read Colin Wilson's stuff on, on Rasputin. Based on uh, Rasputin's daughter's accounts, um, he, he pieced, pieced something quite interesting together. Rasputin was not for the war. He did have a voice in court. He, the, the most crucial part of the whole Fandango was when the Tsar ordered Russian mobilisation. The minute that had happened, everything else is just, you know, that's it, mate. If Rasputin had been around, maybe he could have changed that. But he had been stabbed in the stomach by some peasant woman who was screaming at him that he was the Antichrist in his hometown. And so he's out of commission. Now, Colin Wilson looked at the different accounts and he suddenly felt that he realised that they both occurred on the same day. Uh, and then he looked more into it, he looked at the timing and the latitude and the longitude and the account given by Rasputin's daughter when he was stabbed is exactly the same time as Sarajevo shootings. <laughs> now I've since, you know, I've written about this and it's a great, 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 great story. I've since dived into the murky world of Rasputin forums and it's incredible how disputed every last flipping detail about all this is. You would think, you know, considering there's telegrams going back and forth between the royal family and people in the army and, you know, that it would be really easy to establish. Uh, it's not, it's not absolutely agreed upon when Rasputin was stabbed and in, to what extent it was in total proximity with Sarajevo but it's somewhere at the same time and essentially Rasputin who is one of this incredible cast of characters is manoeuvred out of the way you know that's very strange I also think you know I don't know if you, if you saw the BBC did this drama the other week 37 Days which was this uh, three part thing examining uh, British politicians and, and how they responded to the Sarajevo crisis from there to the point the war breaks out. One of the, the main players is Sir Edward Grey, the foreign yeah, secretary, sure. and he's got this famous quote about the lights going off all over Europe. Well, I started looking at Edward Grey and I thought, what the hell? You know, this is a guy whose brother has been eaten by a lion. You know, this is a guy, you know, I keep thinking William Hague, you know, that's my perspective. William Hague, his brother's been eaten by a lion. Uh, his other brother, I think, was killed by a water buffalo. His wife uh, was killed in an accident with a horse. Um, two of his houses burned down. And he was also an ornithologist who was vir virtually an ornithological mystic. He wrote, <laughs> he wrote this book about birdsong after the First World War. 
that is still revered to this day as some great evoker of, of, of you know the mysticism of Birdsall and it's like how weird is that for a British Foreign Secretary you know that's ridiculous this is the guy that's actually right there at that moment of tremendous destiny I don't know whether you saw there was a, a great Channel 4 documentary on the Kaiser and his childhood a few were not that long ago it was, was it Channel 4 I watched something about Victoria's children on the BBC that, had, that was another yeah. one yeah that was, that was another one the yeah. Kaiser you know he had been born with a withered arm as a result of a British doctor that had been sent to oversee the birth by Queen Victoria getting it wrong and so the whole of his childhood he endured these sort of weird treatments that was, were virtual torture some real weird stuff like um, a recently killed hare being wrapped round his arm you know being strapped in metal and, and all sorts of stuff like that and he was also quite bizarrely incestuously attached to his mother he wrote he wrote letters to her that like you know you, a, a one act play an art house play you know Kaiser Wilhelm on the couch with Sigmund Freud you know it's definitely a case for treatment and you think well there's him there's Nicholas II who is this weird vacillatory character he's like Montezuma you know or Louis in the French Revolution it's like that there has to be the world historical drama requires that there is this weird weak character at the helm who could actually have saved the day and it could have all turned out totally differently but in fact it's all got to go down the toilet you know and he's in place and most bizarre of all um, is Helmuth von Molka who was the guy in charge of the operation of the German Schlieffen plan which was the whole military plan on how they were, how they were going to win the war on two fronts and how they were going to knock France out in one go I first heard about this in Spear of Destiny because Spear of Destiny is so unreliable I thought I needed to check it out uh, a bit further and there's no doubt about the fact that uh, his wife was uh, profoundly committed to the teachings of Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy he himself had met Steiner there was a fair bit of contact between them and after Moltke died in 1916 because he was held to blame for the failure of it Steiner believed that he had contact with him before the, beyond the grave and produced enormous corpus of material relating to Moltke and his alleged past lives and you know the background to the First World War now regardless of Steiner's post-mortem material the fact that the guy that is actually right there at the fulcrum of the whole destiny of does the First World War end in a couple of weeks flat with a German victory or does it turn into four years of total nightmare and the end of empires and a totally different outcome is actually somebody that's got a head full of Steiner mm. you know this is profoundly flipping weird to me and the connections how that then leads into what becomes World War Two. You know, there are so many strands of where you see uh, if one timeline had been slightly different, then this would have been. Uh, and again, you know, I found it, it's fascinating in 1907 to see, you know, what happens to Hitler. You know, Hitler's mother dies of, of cancer after a whole year of, of being suffering with the disease. He gets turned down for art college at Vienna. And this is all at the same time that various things are happening. Uh, with Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels, his Order of the New Templars. Yeah. You know, Hitler's mother dies on the winter solstice, 1907. Uh, Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels raises a swastika flag uh, at Berg Werfenstein, which is his, like his proto Weibelsberg castle that he gets in, in Austria on Christmas Day. And a couple of days later, uh, not that far into the, the sessions, uh, Bly Bond and Captain Bartlett start getting weird apocalyptic messages about a war coming. You know, this is like um, 30th of December, something like that. So you got all these kind of things, and when you just look at them with that perspective, they do well to me. They really do resonate. You know, they're, they're yeah. quite extraordinary. There is, I think. Uh, uh, this kind of alt history or um, general history is sorely in need of a new paradigm that involves the the sing stuff. What uh, what blew my mind when we were talking about it in October was the uh, Melchizedek mind Kampf connection. I thought that was extremely interesting. Yeah, the fact that the unfortunate's in the throes of, a, of an initiatory drama in Glastonbury that leads to. 
the writing of the Cosmic Doctrine and her connection with Melchizedek as the head of a magical order at the same time, essentially, that Hitler's writing Mein Kampf and is then let out of prison, uh, seems pretty damn strange to me. And there's also a whole bunch of stuff uh, with Steiner and the second Gerthingham building and a whole profound uh, spiritual practice called the Foundation Stone Meditation that is absolutely central to uh, Anthroposophy and a conference that was had at Christmas 1923 that is considered to be, you know, the Anthroposophists consider it to be the most significant event of the 20th century, which considering what else happened in the 20th century is pretty full on. But all these things are manoeuvring at the same time. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you can see it, you know, Wellesley Tudor Pole and Blybond, their psychic material is full of optimism as the First World War ends. But then you reach a period where they say, something's going wrong here. There's, you know, the brakes have been put on this. The opposing forces are still there and they're coming in. And it's, it's the same period of time that Nazi Party has been founded and Hitler is just starting to find his way in that. And, and when you see that, you, uh, you, know, you can't fail but to feel that somehow that, that this is all one big picture that you're looking at. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the, um, we have a flatland analysis of history uh, and you can, um, when you put the pieces together, realise that there are longer fingers coming through from uh, an additional dimension moving things. There are other ways you end up um, with very tenuous um, and ridiculous conspiracy theories mm -hmm. and stuff that just cannot work in any other way. Oh, other than to me, the synchronisation of dates is the thing that, that grabs my attention. Yeah. You know, and you're very good at it. Carl, Carl Maria Villiger, who was, who was Himmler's magus, you know, the magus of Babelsberg, if you like, barking mad, but, you know, he, he created an awful lot of interesting stuff. He dies the same week as Dion Fortune. Amazing. You know, yeah, he, <laughs> I love that. You know, the magical back of Britain. Uh, to what extent Villiger was even involved in it, but he's the man who put the stamp on Babelsberg. You know, it's quite possible that... Babelsberg was never finished. To say what was going on in Babelsberg during the physical battle of Britain, you can't. You know, I'm not saying there were a bunch of guys in robes waving salt about and sacrificing people and blah, blah, blah in Babelsberg there. I don't think that was what was going on at all. But, you know, the whole idea of, of the Black Camelot and of what you've got as, as the energetic oppositional force to what has been, you know, bigged up around Glastonbury... That's all there, you know, and Villiger is the man most strongly strongly associated with it as magician. And, you know, Dion Fortune, it said, was, was ultimately burnt out and exhausted by the war and, you know, died prematurely. Well, Villiger died the same week. Mm, amazing. Yeah, all of these things. Uh, so I'm kind of, at the moment, uh, I'm doing a tribute lecture to Colin Wilson in a couple of days' time, so I've been really going for Colin Wilson. And I might even turn it into a short kindle book mm. but you know after that I'm back into Dion Fortune and the Age of Michael with a vengeance and I hope I get it out this, this this year but I have to you know as you probably understand from the stories that I told about Poets and all the rest of it when you really get in, into the flow of these things you just owe it to yourself to see how far they go I mean I have a yep. certain internal kind of editor that says, all right, Paul, that's enough for that. And, yeah. you know, 10, 20 pages that have taken me three weeks to work out are, are, are just sidelined, uh, and, and that's out of the main narrative. But what you've learned through that, the feeling that you've got, the appreciation that you've got for the whole thing, uh, that that's the thing in itself. You know, that level of satisfaction uh, may never be communicated through the book itself, but in terms of, of the fact that if you if you write a book about magic it has to be a magical experience absolutely that's simple isn't it yeah absolutely uh, it certainly always has been for me nice well I hope something comes out of it this year because we'll end on this what do you think about the fact that it's not just the centenary of um, the first world war this is a year of dates um, Jacques de Molay 700 uh, Magna Carta 75 World War 2 it is 50 years 1964 1964 yeah. is quite a biggie in its own right in terms of, of the six days mythos so this is interesting it's almost like uh, an, uh, an astrological alignment of dates of, of, of resonant uh, resonant I guess incidents that 
seem to be swirling into into the one year. Well, I'm still, you know, maybe a lot of people have forgotten about it or embarrassed about it or don't want to talk about it, but I still believe broadly in the 2012 Mythos, I still believe that we did um, hit a culmination point and that what is going on now is part of that still. It's an enormous great recap of our consciousness of of historical cycles. That's what's basically happening. It's like we're being invited to you know make sense of and change our emotional relationship to enormous great processes and in order to do that you, you, you have to be conscious of them in the first place so all these anniversaries and stuff that are on this you know the way our calendar configures uh, it, it, it's thrown them all up for us yeah and we are being invited you know we've certainly been invited with the first world war stuff I think to heal something I think so. And I think the fact that they've all landed in the same day, and I largely agree with the analysis, is that uh, it it summons them up into our uh, front of mind again. And what, it's quite interesting to layer um, Magna Carta, First World War, um, Second World War, all these things, all within a couple of months of each other, boom, 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 in, in the face of, uh, of the culture. And I do consider that. I and, think that's. And I think when people change. like, you know, the likes of David Cameron and co will try to co opt all of this into their own, you know, celebratory structure that somehow keeps their show on the road. But I think it just becomes increasingly visible and obvious how protest that is. And, well, and, and people can see through it, you know, even people that are quite supportive of their reality can see that there's something grotesque about them trying to basically get a copyright on something that they have no right to have. Well, the, yeah, the, the old iconic magic works less uh, post 2012 which is maybe something you're saying it's you don't even need to read um, alt or conspiracy literature anymore even the most simplistic person can watch the BBC and go this is all garbage yeah <laughs> I like I liked some um, in your blog that story about you being in the taxi and the taxi yeah that was wild suddenly sort of goes into one yeah. you know like they, they, there's a walk in there to just you know talk a particular yeah. There was great stuff in, in the very early days of the Greenstone saga when it was getting a bit full on. You know, Andy and Graham, they were living in this flat in Wall Ramp, so far, oh God, you know, let's just let off some steam, we'll have a party, we'll invite people around for the local pub and all the rest of it. And they did, you know, invited people that they didn't even know. And, and one of them was uh, a police woman, you know, she was just sort of off duty and all the rest of it and having a few beers. And, all, and suddenly she just collapses on the floor She's just lying there with her eyes open, just saying, Akhenaten, Akhenaten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't leave me alone. No. It just would not leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thanks very much. That was fantastic. Yeah, well, I enjoyed talking about it all. Yeah, you know, indeed. It's, 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 it's yeah. great to sort of um, put it out there, uh, knowing that there are people such as yourself who appreciate the nuances of it and that it is you know, a fairly full on scenario. Well, it, it is. And I mean, I, I came to your books only a couple of years ago. Um, I had them for a bit longer and I'd read um, 21st Century Grail uh, beforehand. But what, uh, and we started corresponding about this, but what I thought was interesting is that from the outside, um, say the Arthurian mythos, mythos is um, interesting and it, it has, I guess, you can derive emo emotional lessons from it. But it does appear incomplete until you start to work with it. And then all of a sudden, once you're inside it, it's like a tarnus. It's a lot bigger mm -hmm. from the inside than it is from the outside. And uh, that, um, that I got from your books after having uh, a lifelong fascination with uh, general Arthurian things and reading some very, very surface and, and really flimsy um, sort of Jungian analyses of, of what these things might mean mentioning no author's names because I'm sure you've read some of the books it all just seemed very impotent uh, and then sort of picking up the fact that you would run with it in a much more um, performative and physical way and, and got results out of it I started doing something similar and um, you know the stuff in Wales and, yeah. and the rest of it and Tintagel as well uh, and it's it's really compelling to see uh, and that, yeah so thank you very much well, I, th I think I started off, you know, a long time ago, I saw Gareth Knight's Secret Tradition in Arthur in Legend, and I got it, and I read it loads of times, and it was like, there was something about it that didn't click with me, but it was still saying to me, if you follow broadly where this is leading, something is going to be activated that will lead you to your own, whatever, you know, I needed to see all of that. 
and that in turn has come from, from Dion Fortune but in the end you've got to kind of activate your own cabal on it rather than somebody else's and this is why um, well I can't exactly see me joining any of these orders at this stage of the game you know it's like in terms of what did I deliver I think we start we didn't really we, we run with the ball a little bit you know one of the things that, that was really incredible about the questing days and why I'm big on Alchemical Mercurius and the Trickster is that combination of people you, you cannot manufacture it you know no. you, you can you know Andy you know he's done it for years he does public lectures people come along he'll set up a group and he'll get different combinations of people and he's you know he's had some great people over the years but that particular combination of people then was absolutely flipping astonishing and the way we were so incredibly divergently different but we all gelled together and we all just you know we just hung all the time everybody was you know was talking to everybody on the phone every day or seeing everybody every day and just everything created this dynamic and everyone was getting their own things but we also had this group dynamic and just that sense that once you got a few major results you were willing to believe anything could happen yeah you know, you could you go out somewhere on in some lake, and we were quite willing to believe that you know an arm with a sword would come up out of it. We were quite willing to believe that shit like that could happen, because Graham Phillips had heard. Um, oh, one day, man, I'll tell you all the Graham Phillips stories. No. <laughs> they are they are in a class of their own. They are. He's probably the most dangerous man on the planet. It's a good job that he hasn't. He, he, he's a bit frightened of it he hasn't really got the, you know he's so scared of what he's capable of doing there is some serious fucking shit gone down around him and because we had this corpus of material about how far reality can bend we just thought well we can probably do that then yeah. and we certainly got quite quite a long way with it I've got to tell you have you got a few moments I've got to tell you yeah get it Philip Stewart I've got to tell you man. there was this guy called Terry Shotton and he was part of the Greenstone and the Eye of Fire saga and you know he lived in a house in the countryside and they used to hang there and stuff used to happen and his garden and his own became paranormal central but it got a little bit out of hand um, it all gets pretty difficult in the, in the Eye of Fire there are some dark paranormal forces that haunt them and, and mess them about but it got a lot worse than this there was a thing that they called the Bane and this this thing turned the shot and our soul into the Amy Villora. You know, it was like green slush puking out of the toilets and out of the taps, and you know, the granny in the granny annex going mental and coming in and saying, "You're all gonna die." You know, it's like stuff out of a horror film. And the sense that they were playing a game with it, and it, it, it you know, it, it spoke through somebody or another and said, "You need to go out in the garden." and they went down the bottom of the garden and um, there was like a Waddington's board game okay and it was called Buck O'Shotty's Crazy Bane Game and it actually had pictures of them you know like drawn in artwork all the people that were there going to Sunderland Graham Terry Shot and actually had pictures of them on it and they opened the game up and it had like little figures okay and it was like an interactive board game <laughs> it's like right if if you win I'll go um, if you lose there's going to be a massive you know nuclear event go down and they played and they lost and Chernobyl was the next day nice uh, stuff like that was going on now when we heard these stories we just thought oh come on this is just fucking ridiculous we can't possibly believe this but in in the noughties Deb Benstead was on a train and she struck up a conversation with this geezer and it turned out it was Terry Shorten's son which is re ridiculous anyway and she said well look we've heard these stories what what really went on then and he just said if I ever see Graham Phillips again I'll fucking kill him he ruined their entire lives and yeah they you know he actually said we did have that board going we did find it in the garden we did you know that stuff was going on when I was a little kid all that stuff really happened but even more outlandish than that Graham did this stuff called dimension swapping this is corking you know like 
shot and would hear a banging on the front door and he'd open the door and there's Graham Phillips now, Graham's quite a big guy but Graham he's like he's got a ripped vest on and he's like Rambo you know he's not even got the same body quick 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 they're coming they're coming the planes are coming he drags Terry shot out into the garden and there's like flipping explosions somewhere over in the distance and there's like sounds of guns and there's like flipping helicopter flying overhead and shot what the fuck and he literally, you know, runs back indoors and slams the flipping door and peeks out through the window and it's, it's nothing, you know. And, like, Graham would, you know, you'd meet up with a Graham and it wasn't like Graham, it was some other Graham and he was, like, Graham number two or whatever and, and he'd be talking to you and he'd be telling you stuff that, like, I'll remember when you, we did such and such and it was, like... You'd never actually done it, and you'd, but, and you'd never talked to him about it, but it was something you'd always wanted to do. And if you'd have met some, you know, it nearly happened. Remember, oh, when you were telling me about that business that you used to be in, in such and such a place, and you never actually were in that business, and you'd never been at that place, but you actually nearly did, and you'd never told anybody about it. And it was like he would, and uh, you know, he'd wake up on a park bench in, in, in Exeter with an empty bottle of vodka, and he had no idea how he'd got there. And somebody else had been with another Graham a couple of hundred miles away, and they told him a whole bunch. And uh, that sort of stuff was happening with him. And in fact, he wasn't the only person that it was happening with. There were two other guys in our questing group who also had what we called dimension swap experiences. In fact, one of Andy's best mates, Richard Wald, he had a whole scenario where um, he was in a, in a town centre and the shops were all different. You know, and he went into shops, and the stuff that they were selling in them was like weirdly, like you know, so we've got iPods or something like that. There was something else on sale there that we haven't got, and it was like what you know. And he was looking through the albums, you know, for a particular band, and there was an album that didn't exist, you know, and things like that, or, or the books, you know. Even he was like, what the fuck is this? And it was only. You know, he pulled his car up the country road and went to sleep and woke up and he was back in normal again. Uh, but the more outlandish ones than, than, than that, you know, of, of there's one guy who swears blind that he's, he's been in places where, like, the Nazis had invaded Britain, you know, and you could still see some of the remains of some of where the battles were fought and you could go and see it on a historical tour and this and that was different. And, you know, CDs were little... All that sort of stuff. And... You know, we saw it on what a couple of occasions we saw him allege. You know, whether he was playing a game, it was a pretty good game he was playing that he he, he kind of did a dimension swap and he was somebody else. But he was talking to you about stuff that was really personal to you that you'd never told anybody else about, like that you hadn't done, but you could quite easily you could have done or something had just stopped you at the last minute and it, oh yeah remember when we did oh blah 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 and it was like well how, how have you got that mm. how have you created that I've never told anybody about that and that was how you know he, in the end he, he, would, he would tell me you know um, the one that weirded me out the most he rang me up at work actually when I was working in the warehouse and he told me about you know, I've been in one of the other universes and in that universe the process church of the final judgment never folded. It carried on in this country and it became really successful and you became the head of the Luciferian branch of the process church of the final judgment. And I just thought, well that's a good fantasy. I can quite see myself doing that. He says you know, you were like John Lennon in Arm in an Armani suit and you were doing this, that and the other. Uh, he didn't really even know that I was quite fascinated with the process church of the final judgment. But what was so strange about this news from another dimension was, you know, he'd rung me up at 20 past four in the afternoon. When I got home, there was a message on the phone from my mother at half past four. And my father had collapsed in the living room, just collapsed in the living room, and they'd taken him to hospital. And in fact, that did mark the demise of my father because within a matter of days, he was dead. So being told that somebody's seen you in another dimension and you're the head of, the, of, the, of, of a branch of the process church of the final judgment uh, in the Luciferians at the same time that essentially your father collapses to die 
is strange yeah. you know it's like on the one hand it, it, however much it seems to be nonsense the way it lands with you has this resonance that you just think what the fuck is going on here so that sort of outlandish background you know that's that's all part of 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 what's in my mindset you know and that was 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 there for us in 1990 we could all end up dimension swapping into some other reality or whatever we never did but because we knew that these things seemed to happen whatever even if it wasn't exactly what he said it was it was something pretty flipping weird that was not on anybody's maps you know we didn't know anybody else you know we read flipping loads of books between us we knew the research, we knew the field of the paranormal, there didn't seem to be an all, we seemed to be pretty much out there on our own. And that was the thing that carried on, you know, when I went through my initiatory dramas in South End and had my letters given aside, blah, 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 someone that's been on the front page of some for having sex with a serial killer, blah, blah. I didn't know anyone else that could say that. I didn't know, I, I couldn't sort of point to any sort of book that, oh yeah, this is that, and it. You know, I, I had to just, I tell you, the, I've got to tell you the Carly, uh, the Carly X murder um, story. This is this is. Um, I'm working in Southend in the VAT building, you know, and it was like every when I first went in there, crawling with normals, couldn't bear it, absolutely terrible. In the end, the, the amount of weirdness that kicked off in there. Obviously, you got this woman who's on, been on the front page or something. There was a guy who used to come to the Earthquakes meetings. He was all right, a bit of a dork maybe, but he was all right. And he started talking about Carly a lot. You know, there are people that get into Carly, and some of them are really into Carly, and some of them are striking a pose to be badasses. Uh, and it wasn't quite sure what was what with him. But people started to get a feeling something's not quite right here. You know, I don't know if I want to hang out with him. Uh, a good example, he went on holiday in the countryside, camping with some guy, and they just they were walking through the woods they found a, a, like a dead cow with its guts ripped out just lying on their path you know and it was like don't see that that often do you you know so whoa don't know about this so there's a sense that something's building up with him and got a bit of a tumultuous relationship with his sister you know he comes home from work she's sold his record collection and things like that you know it's all a bit leery but one day he goes to see his sister and her boyfriend in their flat they're a couple of floors up in a block of flats and they decide to all do some shrooms together okay so they're all tripping and the boyfriend massively loses the plot gets out of machete hacks this guy's sister to fucking death commits Harry Keary sticks the fucking machete right through his stomach and goes out the window he didn't even die didn't even die but here's my mate you know the story the story as I like to tell it you know I am I took from Captain Kirk in Rafa Khan the basic belief that there was no such thing as a no win situation and that you can change the rules of the game if you don't like it but in a situation like that what the fuck you know imagine it you are tripping your head off on mushrooms and your sister is fucking lying hacked up in front of you and this guy's just Harry Keary'd out of the window now what I mean he didn't kill himself you know I didn't hear an awful lot about what did happen after that but it was like that was that, obviously that's, that's that's another local newspaper job there was a woman um, in the same office on the same floor as me she did her she was pregnant and when she left you know they did a big baby share and they had all the all the paraphernalia hung up round her desk and it's all great. And then um, the old postnatal kicks in and her husband comes home from work and she's dancing around in the living room like a failure, you know, singing this little little song about we don't need to worry anymore, the baby's dead now. And he sees that the window's open and she's fucking thrown the baby out the window, you know, and it's dead and that's front page of the local newspaper. I'm in a cremation ground, Mandala. This is the this is supposed to be Normsville, man. This is the VAT office in South End, you know. And this is what is going on around me. And again, the only 
point of commonality, if you like, because these people don't know each other. The the person that is perceiving it all is me. You know, I was sitting in a corner in this. Uh, originally, all the people around me were complete normals. And for example, one day they bring in this guy. He's he's, a, he's eighteen and he's taking a year off from college before he goes to university. And he's sitting down next to me. I'm in a fifteen floor building. There's a thousand people working in it. So the fact that he ends up next to me is kind of interesting. So he's there a few days. I don't really get to chat to him that much. But one day, after everyone else has gone, we're both trying to make a bit of flex of time. It's just me and him left in there. It turns out his father was a South End werewolf. I don't know if you remember the South End werewolf. This guy was on the front page of The Sun, thought he was a werewolf. You know, he pulled up in a police car park with a prostitute in the car, proclaiming, you know, lock me up, I'm a werewolf, blah, blah, blah. It's his fucking father, in it? So, of all the people in the whole bloody building to sort of plonk him next to, you know, it's me. So he tells me the stories that, you know, they still have. I remember one morning he came in, he said, oh, we had the exorcists round last night. Was it business or social? And like the normals, the normal, I don't know what they thought. I think they just gave up in terror in the end because I, I, I won. I completely took the entire thing over with the weirdness. The woman that was in charge of the whole office was a spiritualist who thought that each night when she went to sleep she she got taken into some giant cathedral of light where all these angelic beams were healing her. You know, she was the woman in charge of the whole thing. And I was just surrounded by people that were like, off on one, you know, yeah. and, and things like that happening. And it got more and more and more and more and more and more intense. You know, there was a woman, I met her for a mutual friend, quite powerful woman, quite psychic, and she came around my house once, and she just immediately, whatever it was that had been involved in something a little bit dark and weird, you know, like a candle that had been used in a thing that brought the Gorgons out of the sea in Cornwall or whatever, or something to do with when I had the Saqqara Step Pyramid, you know, she'd say, well, well, why do I get a carty for this? And what, you know, and she was really full on. She became a kind of motif of strangeness because she ended up on the um, front pages of a load of nationals because she uh, wanted to marry the Yorkshire River. She was one of these kind of people. And there were just these grotesque stories, you know, newspaper headlines, she was going to have breast enlargement I want bigger boobs for my darling ripper <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you you could not make it the fuck up you really couldn't and it, what, what would happen for a period of years is whenever things got a bit strange suddenly she'd come out of the woodwork in some absolutely bizarre the, the weirdest one, one Easter, there was this art gallery in London and she did this thing where she basically was crucified on this cross naked whilst uh, a tape recording of a hypnotic regression uh, session that she'd done recalling her own sexual abuse as a youngster was played. And on another occasion, she turned up as a, as a porn star who specialised in large insertions and things like that. I think she's a hip hop poet now. Her yeah. name's Sandra Lester. She's still about, but it was like you just knew, you know, if if the wind changed and something a bit darker and stranger, your your synchronicity warning. Okay, be prepared. Yeah was that she would just turn up on the, you know, you'd be channel surfing, it'd be channel four, half eleven at night, and there she was, you know. Uh, and it was just so bizarre, you know, it was so bizarre. Well. So there's a few little, little yeah, things to cool. come play. Absolutely. <laughs> that works. But that was, that was the force of initiation, that was yeah. the archetype. That would, I, I, won't, I won't be so pretentious as to say I crossed the abyss, but there was something pretty fucking serious going on during that period of yeah. time. You know, there definitely was. And the other side of it, I came here. And I came here with the level of understanding to see things like the year of the maggot murder and poesy sensibilities. That's what he kind of fine tuned me with. 
Yeah. And I don't think that necessarily ever leaves you, you know, and just carrying on reading and writing and just walking down the road is enough. For sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah. After all that. Yeah, most definitely. Well, thank you very much. I don't know how much of that you're going to be able to use. Oh, I'm just going to put it all on. That's gold. <laughs>